You may have heard of the term Jezebel to describe a controlling woman, a woman of certain wickedness, spitefulness, and perhaps one who is promiscuous in nature. It's a reputation that the original Jezebel from the Old Testament would surely sustain since the inception of the text, given the way in which she manipulated her husband, murdered prophets, before swindling, scheming and condemning those who would not follow her commands or accept her own god Baal as the one true god. Jezebel's story is scattered throughout the Book of Kings, but the beginning of her tale shows us that she is brought to the northern kingdom of Israel to marry King Ahab. Her father, Ephbal, the king of Phoenicians, a group of people closest to the Israelites, were eager for Jezebel to marry into Ahab's kingdom so that their kingdoms could share resources, security, and establish a united front. In this sense, it seems clear that the relationship between Jezebel and Ahab were purely political, but the Old Testament makes no reference to the nature of their relationship. The main difference which separated the Phoenicians and the Israelites was the worship of gods. The Israelites primarily worshipped the one god who was known by the Hebrew name Yahweh or Jehovah. Meanwhile, the Phoenicians were said to have a more varied range of gods to choose from, which were considered by the writers of the Old Testament to be the pagan gods. The most critical figure amongst these gods, at least in this story, is the god Baal, the god of fertility and agriculture. When Jezebel is first brought to Israel to marry King Ahab, she brings her gods with her. While the Old Testament doesn't specify Ahab's reaction, it's clear that the gods, or at least Jezebel's commitment to the gods, has a profound effect on him. We are told that Ahab goes as far as to build a sanctuary for Baal in the heart of Israel, going on to worship him and seemingly abandon the worship of Jehovah. Known as a controlling, manipulative woman, it's possible that Jezebel had Ahab under her thumb from the very beginning and that this worship of Baal wasn't of his own volition, but under the direction of his wife. Jezebel, of course, rejects Ahab's god Jehovah and remains true to her own gods, which in a sense shows another side to her as she is militant in her beliefs, non-conforming to societal expectations and unyielding to any man in a time where men were the undisputed rulers. Given how devoting the people of Israel were to God, it shows us how powerful Jezebel actually was as she was able to incorporate her own god Baal into society and render Jehovah nearly redundant. Her scheming and outright domination over Israel with the induction of Baal only further enhances the idea that Jezebel was indeed a bold and calculating woman. But not only this, as the tales go on, we see Jezebel denounce Jehovah and proclaim that Baal, a foreign god to the people, was in fact the one they should all be worshipping. Her impious ways are only further demonstrated when we see her order the killing of several prophets of Jehovah. It's clear by this point that Jezebel is a fierce woman who will stop at nothing to achieve her goal, the goal seemingly being to eradicate the name of Jehovah as well as destroying any and all who defy her. She is clearly not shy of using the power that she has inherited out of her marriage, and some might say she takes more of a fundamental role as queen than her husband does as king. Not only is she thorough and brutal in the murdering of Jehovah's prophets, but she also uses royal resources to fund and support several hundred prophets of Baal. It's understood that during this time of the story, with Jezebel's frightful influence, the people of Israel were torn as to who to worship. Baal was gaining popularity, and those who were in favour of Jehovah were fearful of incurring Jezebel's fury. It seemed that no one was strong enough, nor willing enough, to repel Jezebel's ideals for the nation. Until Elijah. The prophet known as Elijah was concerned about the divide between Jehovah and Baal, especially with the presence of Jehovah now being overtaken. He took matters into his own hands, and challenged the 850 prophets of Baal and the other pagan gods atop Mount Carmel. The challenge was fairly simple. Both Elijah and the prophets of Baal would provide a bull each to be sacrificed before their gods. Whoever's god could light their sacrifice in the most spectacular way would be declared the more powerful god. Two altars were set up and the followers of Baal presented their bull. The prophets danced around the bull so as to appease their god. But after some time, Baal failed to show any sign of his presence at all. The prophets performed their rituals, sending prayers and in some accounts even turned to self-harming so as to draw their god out and accept the challenge. But Baal didn't show. When Elijah stepped forward with his bull, he merely asked Jehovah to show his power, and thus the sky roared and the bull was consumed in a devastating blast of flame. 
it was clear that Jehovah had won the contest by his demonstration of his power, especially given that Baal had remained silent. It's here we see an unremorseful and some might say dark side of Elijah, who spares none of the prophets. He has every single one of the over 800 prophets of Baal hunted down and slaughtered. You might say that this was a complete overkill, or perhaps that it makes Elijah just as bad as Jezebel in some respects, given that he had done just as she had. But you might also argue that Elijah committed this act of butchery out of revenge for the prophets of Jehovah that Jezebel had murdered. The Old Testament does not give way to Elijah's motivations for his mass murder of the Baal prophets, but needless to say it irks Jezebel to the point that she orders Elijah's death. While the death of her prophets would have no doubt angered the queen, it is the consequences of their defeat which might have angered her more, where the people who had converted to Baal converted straight back to Jehovah after witnessing his power. As if this wasn't enough of an expression of his power, God then rewards Elijah by sending him a downpour of rain, which ends a three-year drought in the land. Essentially, this confrontation would spell the beginning of the end of Jezebel's rule and her indoctrination of the foreign god. As a result of this, Jezebel orders the death of Elijah, who realizing the potency of her power, flees and goes into hiding. In some versions, we also see Jezebel establish herself as Elijah's equal, stating, if you are Elijah, so I am Jezebel. Her meaning cannot be mistaken. Despite the loss of her prophets, she is inclined for revenge and is more than capable of delivering it. Elijah's hiding only helps to illustrate the magnitude of Jezebel's power and her potential to achieve all that she desires. Elijah fleeing has some implications. It shows us that God's protection over him is not absolute and that maybe, Elijah maintains some doubt as to God's plan, given that he flees in the first place. Arguably, you might say that God told Elijah to run, as this coincides with what he eventually intends, but nonetheless it still implies that Elijah is afraid of Jezebel, or at least aware enough to know he cannot currently win against her. Around this time, we learn that King Ahab is taking things a little less seriously at home, in his kingdom. He notices that a neighbour of his, named Naboth, is tending to a beautiful vineyard nearby. Upon seeing this vineyard, King Ahab wishes to own it for himself and proceeds to offer Naboth a great deal of money for it. But Naboth explains that the vineyard is something of a family heirloom, passed down from generations after having been gifted it from God himself. He claims that he can never part with it, not for any amount of money. Even as Ahab promises Naboth a bigger vineyard to tend to, Naboth declines. King Ahab proceeds to sulk. He enters a depression at not being able to obtain the vineyard and refuses to eat. He locks himself away in his bedroom and lays down, unwilling to do anything except pine over the vineyard that he knows he cannot have. The king's subjects alert Jezebel as to her husband's sadness, and it's on this occasion we see the dynamic of their relationship deepen. You might say that Jezebel acts with compassion as she speaks to Ahab, telling him that he is a king and that he can have whatever he wants, even the vineyard, which she promises to obtain for him. However, it's more likely that Jezebel is using this scenario to facilitate her own wicked ways as she schemes to obtain the vineyard. Jezebel enlists a few shady characters to create an elaborate ruse in order to frame Naboth for crimes against the king and God. She has this group publicly accused Naboth of blasphemy and treason, which soon gains enough traction that everyone soon believes in Naboth's supposed guilt. Jezebel demands that Naboth is stoned to death, and just like that, Naboth is quickly carried away and brutally murdered. As promised, Jezebel delivers the vineyard to King Ahab, which again shows the difference in power between the two. Ahab was not able to obtain the vineyard, and despite being a king, was not willing to exercise his power to obtain it by force. Jezebel, however, had no qualms with obtaining the vineyard, and the way in which she did shows that unlike Ahab, she will stop at nothing, whether morally wrong or not, to obtain her goal. This event appears to spur on Jehovah to speak to Elijah, who is still in hiding. He tells Elijah the way Ahab will die, and that the same dogs who licked up the blood of Naboth will lick up his blood as well. When Elijah confronts King Ahab, he tells him of God's message and goes on to predict that Jezebel will die, consumed by dogs, and that every family member of Ahab will die as well, ending his legacy. So struck by Elijah's warning, Ahab melts with fear 
and proceeds to repent to Jehovah. During this time, Elijah is led to a man named Elisha, a man in which God instructs Elijah to adopt as his disciple. Elisha would soon become the prophet in Elijah's place after Elijah is taken up by the heavens. Years later, a war breaks out and King Ahab is killed by a stray arrow. It's understood that as he bled out, dogs did indeed feast on his blood, though that there were also pigs present, and that they also licked his blood, marking him as unclean to the Israelites, who abstained from the consumption of pork. It is Ahab and Jezebel's son Joram who assumes the throne in the wake of his father's death. But Joram's rule is not as undisputed as one might think. The prophet Elisha crowns Jehu, the military commander of Yodam, as king, and tasks Jehu with the eradication of Ahab's house, as God had prophesied through Elijah. Both King Joram and Jehu encounter one another on the battlefield in the days leading up to the destruction of the house of Ahab, where Jehu kills Joram. It's during this encounter, funnily enough, that Jezebel earns her reputation for being a witch and a whore. Jezebel is often connected with promiscuity, and yet we don't see any examples of her sexual desires, whether in the form of lust for men or otherwise. The only mention that appears in some versions of the Old Testament is here in the confrontation between Joram and Jehu, where Joram asks Jehu, is all well? To which Jehu replies, how can all be well as long as your mother Jezebel carries on her countless whoredoms and sorceries? While it's never really mentioned explicitly in the Old Testament, Jezebel's status as a harlot, or at least an adulterer, is certainly implied. We finally see Jezebel once more in the Old Testament, where she appears in her upper window to stare down at Jehu with the blood of her son on his hands. Jezebel does not try to flee, however, but stands firm, and perhaps even proud, as she acknowledges her enemy in a calm manner. She is described as having painted her face and dressed her hair, indicating that she made the effort to look the best that she could in the face of her imminent death, a final show of strength perhaps, and a stubbornness to die as a weak woman, but instead, a woman who stared death in the face and didn't blink. Other accounts imply that Jezebel had dressed herself up as a means to seduce Jehu from the window in an effort to save her own life. If this is the case, it shows Jezebel's tenacity once more that she is able to cut her ties to her former husband and all of her subjects, if only to live a moment more, even if it is as Jehu's lover. She is not modest in her defeat though, as she proceeds to taunt Jehu, denouncing him as a murderer of his master and her son. But Jehu doesn't rise to her mocking and instead looks to her eunuch servants in the window. He simply asks them to cast Jezebel down from the window. Knowing that they were at Jehu's mercy, the eunuchs betray Jezebel and throw her from the window. It's told that her blood sprayed the walls as she hit the ground, and that her blood also sprayed the horses, which trampled over her, leaving the wicked, impious queen as nothing more than a twisted, ruined corpse. Jehu celebrated his victory by drinking and feasting, but he did not forget Jezebel's corpse. He asked for her to be buried, given that she was a queen, and that even she deserved to have some modesty in death. However, when his men went to retrieve her body to bury it, they found nothing but her skull, her feet, and her hands. It appeared that the dogs had manifested and feasted on her flesh, devouring almost every inch of her, just as Elijah had once predicted. Let me know if you enjoyed today's video and who you'd like to see next in the Biblical Stories Explained series. Do you think that Jezebel was as bad as the Bible has her pegged? Or do you think that there are some qualities about Jezebel that stand out from her often wicked reputation? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below and as always, don't forget to like this video and hit the subscribe button. Until the next time guys.